the, the, what I'm going to start with, the first two lectures, a lecture today on Walter Benjamin, and a lecture tomorrow on Theodore Adorno. Uh, and then I'm the one who asked you to stay another hour or so uh, at 4.30 and see Lemonade, if you haven't seen it by Beyonce. Uh, the music is okay, but the video is really quite phenomenal. Um, and so I wanted you to see that because that's sort of your homework assignment for tomorrow, and then we'll talk about Adorno and Beyonce. Uh, <laughs> but today, and so I mean, this is going to range historically over a large, large panoply of uh, issues. Uh, but what I want, and, and I also want to say that um, I see my role in public intellectual circles today as. Um, you know, trying to particularly address uh, Islamic civilization and uh, Islam today. It's uh, something I've been working on since 2001, as a matter of fact, since September 12, 2001, because I realized I knew nothing about that civilization or the billion of people who call themselves Muslims. Uh, so that is something of the politics of this project. Um, and uh, so that, that's been a strain. It's a difficult thing to do if you're so thoroughly you know, embroiled in the, um, the Western paradigm. And we don't say Western-centric, we just say modernity. And supposedly that's a neutral term. It isn't a neutral term at all. Uh, everyone's in modernity, it seems to me, but we're in modernity in very different modalities. And uh, that doesn't mean different temporalities to me. I'm really kind of against that term. I have a lot of issues at stake with a lot of uh, the, the uh, intellectual debate. But what I really, really want help from you from, uh, with, is how, uh, how some of these ideas are working. And if they aren't, you must challenge me on it. Because um, this is an experimental thing, and I'm giving you my latest work, stuff that's not published, and maybe never should be published, or at least not without your input. So. Uh, that to begin. Now, um, I begin today, Walter Benjamin in Ramallah. I don't know if you know, but uh, Walter Benjamin is being translated into Arabic. This is a kind of first. Um, it's happening with Goethe Institute support, because let's get these uh, good German intellectuals <laughs> being sold in Arabic language. And uh, so there was a conference, actually, uh, Slavoj came to it as well, in Ramallah. Uh, which uh, Sammy Cotton uh, organized along with people in multiple countries. Uh, and it, it was a terrific turnout. I stayed for the week and really, really learned a ton because here was this Benjaminian figure uh, simultaneous with a conference in uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, or a week later, it, there was this conference in Ramallah. So you had this very different kind of reception because, of course, uh, uh, Israel has very much incorporated uh, Benjamin into their tradition, right? And I'm very much opposed to this idea of a vertical slice of history belonging to different people. I think that's uh, precisely a problem. So um, this is kind of beginning with whose past? This is a beautiful still. It's actually by a filmmaker, uh, an Israeli filmmaker, uh, a, a critical uh, 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 filmmaker, and it was the um, the uh, the poster for the conference. Now, um, the problem with working with Adorno and Benjamin, you know, you read Adorno and Benjamin, and you and they have this great critique of modernity, but you have to realize their modernity is almost a hundred years old. So you can't presume that the same categories of understanding and analysis will work. Uh, ours is a very different world. Uh, inextricably interrelated in a global uh, public sphere. And that I, I don't consider global public sphere to be some Habermasian ideal. I, I consider it to be our um, horrible, nightmarish reality. Because there is no common discourse in this inextricably intertwined um, world. Economic determinism is affirmed in its capitalist form as far as the uh, ideology is concerned. We're in a very the only kind of similarity is a kind of neoliberal ideology of pro-entrepreneurial, pro-individual uh, interest, um, pro-market mechanisms as a resolution to problems along with technological fixes. Um, and the individualism is a new form of conformism. Okay? 
So you don't have this kind of mass psychology so much as a kind of celebration of the individual, which itself is utterly conformist. So at the same time, we share in common the precariousness of the planet, while social relations are left to chance, and the future of the human race to blind fate. I mean, we say these words, but you know, they're actually the reality that you will live for for many more years than I. So uh, it's it's not a nice thing to hear as a young person. But fortunately, you're all ridiculously optimistic, so we can feel happy. <laughs> a new conception of universal history, therefore, I think which would be some sort of common inheritance of the past, is vital to, uh, to break the spell of political nationalisms that prevent international solidarity. My work for the past 10 years then, whatever the historical particulars of the content from the slave Caribbean to the first century of the Christian era, has been focused on, you might say, obsessed with the question, how to do history as philosophy. Politically, the form of this question is how to understand universal history in terms of a communist or communist, I'm not sure which is the best word, inheritance of the past. So this is a project in universal history, which is, of course, totally what we aren't supposed to do. Now, in this process, I have found Walter Benjamin the most helpful philosopher to think with. Adorno's individualistic method is one of dialectic negation. From this perspective, Benjamin's philosophical work appears indeed to be situated, as Adorno famously wrote, at the crossroads between magic and positivism. Now, I would salvage Benjamin from Adorno's critique by changing the wording. I would salvage Benjamin from, pardon me, uh, and this is the changed wording. This crossroads is between a kind of notion of transcendence, which is taboo among postmodern thinkers. A notion of transcendence, an unnameable, unknowable truth. I want to redeem that. And materialist history, the transient actuality of the present. My presentation can be understood um, not as Sheik's <coughs> philosophy in the Hegelian sense, but in the more modest term that Benjamin used when he named his, what we call the, the thesis on the philosophy of history, was called On the Concept of History. Uh, so my question then, in short, is how to write history as philosophy. Now, Philosophy become, becomes political not through being first conceived in thought and then applied to a political situation or to a politicized analysis of history, but rather the construction of a historical constellation is itself the philosophical presentation. There is a parallel here to Benjamin's position in the author as producer. I don't know if you know that 1934 essay when he argues, and he was arguing in this in a uh, Communist Front organization in Paris, the tendency of a literary work can be politically correct only if it is also literarily correct. That is to say, the politically correct tendency includes a literary tendency. The correct political tendency of a work thus includes its literary quality because it includes its literary tendency. Now, this is kind of redundant, but it is in a sense. What he's trying to say is there isn't great art here and good politics there, that somehow or other the two have to be uh, one project. Um, and of course, this means that one's intellectual work cannot be propaganda, manipulation, whatever. It has to be an actual search um, uh, in, in a, a sense where I would use the term truth. And that's another very unpopular word. So. Um, Similarly, history writing to be truthful in not merely a positivist sense, but in a philosophical sense, does not aim at being tendentious, does not aim at demonstrating a partisan commitment that divides the world into good guys and bad guys, or victims and victors, or the morally pure and the ontologically evil. Rather, philosophical truth proceeds from concrete historical material and 
it does so in images. This is again from Walter Benjamin. Now images for him is not necessarily a visual image, but it's something that just um, hits you in a certain in a certain visual way in your mind. And uh, I have this in common with Benjamin, uh, or let's put it another way. I'm not that good in as a writer. I don't write, I mean, you know, some people, like the person you'll hear this afternoon, can sit in an airplane and write a book, but I can't do that. I really have to have this kind of image constellation in front of me, either in my mind's eye or literal, literally, to find them. And then I can somehow um, know what it is that I want to say with what I think needs to be said. Uh, and so, um, what I'm showing you here is Emily Jassier's Stazione. Uh, I don't know if you know her as a uh, painter um, or as an artist. She doesn't, she doesn't paint. Um, she uh, is a Palestinian whom I saw in Ramallah this time, and I worked together with her um, on a project for uh, Documenta a, a couple of years ago. And some of this material is from uh, my time with her then, and other is uh, what I uh, pulled together for Ramallah. Uh, this was a project that Emily did for the Venice uh, Biennale in 2009, and all she did, all she wanted to do as an intervention into public space was uh, to put in Arabic letters the same stops as appeared in Western letters on the buses, public transport in the city. And this was to kind of echo the fact that Venice was very, very much tied in with the Arab world for um, all the way through the Renaissance, and the Renaissance would have been impossible without those connections. It was a simple project. Um, and this is the way it was supposed to look. But then, of course, the authorities decided that it was politically dangerous and she was not allowed to do the project. <clears throat> now, anyone who has worked with Benjamin's quotations in the Arcades project realizes that it is not at all clear what side Benjamin is taking. Does he or does he not agree with the authors whom he cites? He'll cite an author, then you wonder, you know, is this affirming or <laughs> criticizing? Or how does he stand? Is this a good guy or a bad guy? You know, tell us. And he doesn't tell us. But for a historical materialist concerned with the truth of history, that's the wrong question. History is constructed, but not subjectively. It is not narrative. It is not about the historian's intent. It is indeed factual positivist as a construction. The historical constellation, but positivist as a construction. In other words, it's not just the relating of, of facts as if they were self-evident. They have to be constructed in some sort of constellation. And uh, this constellation ought to be one that surprises us. There is no continuity between the moments of the past and our own that come together. They are foreign, alien, different from our time, and yet suddenly legible through the concreteness of the images they contain. Now, here is my, one of my premises about history and history writing. It is possible to colonize time as well as space. The processes of producing lineages of authenticity imposes a conceptual schema that divides the past into spheres of ownership by particular collectives who claim a specific vertical slice of history set up upon it a flag of national or religious belonging and control the production and distribution of the meanings that are mined within it. These are colonial practices. Contemporary anthropology has led the way in exposing the violent distortions in knowledge that colonization of space entails. Their critique applies as well to colonize time. Now, the kind of history that I am working on was not Benjamin's problem, nor is my writing in any strict sense Benjaminian. But when I worked together with Emily Jassir, I was inspired to describe in tentative terms a method, a way of writing history as philosophy that guides my present work, which is, as you will find out later in the week, about, of all things, the first century. 
And it has guided this work in a way that could not have been thought through without my own struggles to think with Benjamin over all these years and all of the discontinuities between Benjamin and myself. Now, um, when I worked with Emily Jassir for Documenta, here's how it worked. She went and did some field work in the Documenta area. Um, but it, it's in, it was, was Kessel. It? Kessel, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's in Kessel. Yeah. Uh, I didn't go to the opening. It's in Kessel. And so she went there and she took pictures and then she went back to the drawing board and <laughs> I was sent the pictures and I was supposed to write some sort of commentary based on her raw stuff. So here is what you have. Uh, you have um, a staircase juxtaposed to bunk beds, and you will find out in a moment where they're from. This is windows designed not to open all the way. And here you have uh, Brightenau. These are all images from Brightenau, and it is a place that was a, a, a a labor camp, and it became a girls' reformatory after World War II. So it's a place of incarceration and forced labor. Here you have books that were saved from bombing at this site, saved from bombing world, during World War II. They're also bundled up there on the bed, but it was bombed anyway. So these are the burned books. Okay, I will begin with this comment. History is layered, but the layers are not stacked neatly. The disrupting force of the present puts pressure on the past, scattering pieces of it forward into unanticipated locations. No one owns these pieces. To think so is to allow categories of private property to intrude into a commonly shared terrain wherein the laws of exclusionary inheritance do not apply. Now, if we're thinking Walter Benjamin in Ramallah, uh, then I'm going to put together a set of images uh, that might be relevant to that location. This is one of my favorites. I've loved this one since I first found it probably 25 years ago. Um, these are the uh, German soldiers in World War II landing on the Acropolis. And you just see from this that they see, because the Germans owned Greek philosophy and the Greek ancient tradition in their own education. And here they are finally landing on their Acropolis, putting up the flag. I mean, this to me is just absolutely what the appropriation of a past by a nation is all about. And this, of course, is the echo after the war, as nationalism became the necessary move for any group of people. So in a post-colonial situation, this says, if you want to be a nation, you know, be an Iraqi nation, uh, or whatever, in other words, nationalism has to be the road to modernity and the future. So uh, Israel is caught as a kind of extension of Western colonialism on the one hand, and as a kind of, because of the Holocaust, um, a, uh, an anti-colonial uh, affirmation of national independence. Now, this is also, I mean, uh, Jacqueline's going to have to help me here, but how do get nations get born? I mean, this, yeah, I know that, you know, Mark says that revolutions are the midwives of history, but, you know, how does all of this uh, narrative get couched in the language of birth when it's a very male project? And these were the Palestinians during the surrender of the town of Ramla in May 1948. Five prisons are located there, including the maximum security Ayalon prison where Nazis were earlier held, and today, excuse the type of Palestinians. 
Ramla was conquered many times in the course of its history by the Abbasids, the Ikshidids, the Fatimids, and the Seljuks, the Crusaders, the Mamluks, the Turks, the British, and the Israelis. After an outbreak of the Black Death in 1347, which greatly reduced the population and order of Franciscan monks established a presence in the city. Under Arab and Ottoman rule, the city became an important trade center. Napoleon's <coughs> French army occupied it in 1799 on its way to Akbar. I mean, this is, um, this is history. Uh, as each appropriation of historical dominance uh, is coupled with the appropriation of land. Now, we all know about the Elgin marbles since they're right around the corner um, that were taken from the Parthenon by the Brits. But this is, this is my favorite set of images. I, anybody seen this image before? Mm. One, two people. Okay, when I was in sixth grade, this was hanging in the back of the room. It's uh, all of the civilizations of world history. See how big it is, right? So this is actually the, the clearest image, but this is also telling, knowing its human size. It hung there, and I used to turn around and look. I mean, I really fell in love with history because history was, that's what history was, right? <laughs> Which is this kind of, all of these, down the bottom it gets confusing. There are too many different <laughs> kinds of empires and everything, but there, we, we know more about that period too, so we make larger differentiations. But uh, you, you understand immediately, <coughs> immediately, from the color uh, contrast, what's going on there, what we are mapping, and it's essentially uh, political appropriation and control uh, by a group that has a name, uh, but is uh, very much connected with a certain political project. So art teaches us to see things that is training and observation. Um, I, I consider this wise. Um, it's a very, very simple sentence, but I consider it very wise. And here, oh, I have another set of images. Now, I don't know why I'm really showing you these, but I kind of do, because my idea is, uh, and you'll see actually, I think the end of tomorrow's lecture or something, it will make a little bit more sense. What Benjamin does in his kind of dialectical reversal is simply change the background and foreground. I mean, he keeps the same image in a certain way, but it, it moves It moves in different, um, you see it differently, you see it differently. And this, uh, uh, Max Ernst, uh, Benjamin liked Ernst very much, and I'll show you another image of his, I think, on Wednesday. Um, but this, this is really quite wonderful, because this was this kind of categorizing of of different animals and everything, which was very 19th century. It's a form of uh, logic. And what uh, Ernst did in these kind of uh, paint over things, that overpainting, is to block out some and keep others. And he made this, which, you know, in other words, he made the dimensions of this other. Now, the, I, I'm trying to say that the way these constellations should work is not too much more connected than what you're seeing here. Or if you know games of spot the object, where you know you think you're looking at one thing and then suddenly it shifts and you see that your you know the tree actually has a picture of Karl Marx in it. Actually, a former friend of mine sent me his own painting where the branches suddenly look just like his beard and so we, so we so suddenly have Karl Marx, right? So you know these kinds of games that you can play with your eyes, and that's essentially I think what what uh, Benjamin does with these quotations, for instance, and he actually has a way of talking about that if you want to look ahead um, in convolute n, n1, a, 3, and 4, I believe it is, where he uh, has a, a way of changing what he calls the angle of vision, um, so that suddenly something that looks one way looks another. So that's some of the method, and as I told you, I'm not very articulate in language, so um, try to figure out what's going on from those three images. Okay, but this one I just sort of found out about. We all know who she is. This is the birth of Venus, right? And we all know this. It's uh, Max Ernst Repetition, um, which Benjamin knew. Uh, and then you, you see what's happened uh, in the course of Western civilization. <laughs> now, see, that, that would be what would, I would sit there and look at these for three years. 
next to each other, you know, while I while I wrote, and and it, maybe it says absolutely nothing to you, but to me there's a lot to note. Okay, so it's going to get clearer, I hope. Now, oh, now we get to a clearer section, but it's it kind of shows you how this stuff is constructed. Okay, now this clearer section separating the image of the Angelus Novus from the caption that captured it. Okay, now. Long ago and far away, when Benjamin was not a household word, I taught a seminar on Benjamin to my students who didn't know who he was, and I read to them the very famous uh, number nine. There is a picture by Clay called Angelus Novus. It shows an angel who seems about to move away from something he stares at. His eyes are wide, his mouth is open, his wings are spread. This is how the angel of history must look. His face is turned toward the past, where a chain of events appears before us. He sees one single catastrophe which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it at, its feet, at his feet. How many of you have not heard those words? Whew. There's one person I'm so glad he hasn't totally dominated, but you know, and you know the image. You know the image that's coming, right? But when I read this to my class and I asked them to draw the image, that fits that description, I got this kind of image. My students drew mature angels, Christmas card angels, and subtle bodied angels from medieval art. But, of course, this is the image. Now, um, none of the images my students made resembled the Angelus Novus painted by Paul Clay in 1920 and purchased by Benjamin shortly thereafter. But today, the clay watercolor has become famous through Benjamin's reception of it. Indeed, too famous. The words of Benjamin's description are so thickly applied that we cannot see the clay image without the overlay of Benjamin's comments on it. The elements then reverse. The image is a caption for his text rather than vice versa. Benjamin wrote his comments in a specific historical situation, but today Clay's picture is pinned down by that caption pinned down by the determinations of a particular ca catastrophe, the Holocaust, as if it extended endlessly into the future. Philosophical history hardens into ontology. The world without distinctions, and I'm citing Agamben here, is called a prison camp. Now, Clay's picture hangs in the Israel National Museum, indelibly linked to Benjamin's suicide while escaping Nazi-occupied France as a permanent monument to one human catastrophe. But we've had many since then. How the painting got there is a story in itself. It's actually made a play um, called uh, by Gerasi called Four Jews in Parnassus, a conversation between Sholem, Adorno, Benjamin, and Trinberg. It's really a delightful play. I won't read it to you, but uh, it, it, in essence, uh, the painting was discovered to be very valuable by the time Benjamin died and everybody wanted it. Uh, and uh, finally, Sholem got it. Uh, and the poor uh, uh, son, uh, son's widow by that time of Benjamin, of Benjamin um, had no rights to it whatsoever. It was brought by Sholem to his private home, and after Sholem died, his wife then was uh, uh, persuaded by the Israeli National Museum to give it to them. So now it becomes, the, you know, it's, it's been owned, it's been claimed, and with it the entire appropriation of Walter Benjamin. And uh, this, the idea is to say, if Benjamin comes to Ramallah in Arabic, it allows for a whole different possible reception. And that's a good thing. Because Benjamin never, never identified the one last caption he gave to this picture as the only possible one. Quite the contrary. Benjamin's own reading of the clay painting kept changing. Angels were for him ephemeral creatures. In 1992, he planned a topical journal 
under the name Angelus Novus, wherein theology and current commentary were to be one and the same. In 1931, Benjamin bestowed the mantle of the new angel on the irreverent journalist Karl Krauss, whose journal, Da Facco, The Torch, um, made, uh, made Krauss a poetic martial angel fiercely critical of the latest news. And I'm quoting from Benjamin, the very term public opinion outrages Krauss. His satire cleans the linguistic clutter from journalists processed news. Um, and then he compares Krauss to old engravings where there is a messenger who rushes toward us crying, his hair standing on end, brandishing a sheet of paper in his hands, a sheet full of war and pestilence, of cries of murder and pain, of danger from fire and flood, spreading everywhere the latest news, full of betrayal, earthquakes, poison, and fire. And I continue with Benjamin's description of Krauss. Perhaps one of those angels who, according to the Talmud, are at each moment created anew in countless throngs, and who, once they have raised their voices before God, cease and pass into nothing. On this evanescent voice, the ephemeral work of Krauss is modulated. Angelus, that is the messenger in the old engravings. So, the Anglis Novus was this figure, uh, the way he was reading Karl Kraus. Karl Kraus himself looks somewhat crazy in that picture. <laughs> like it. Okay, so two years later, oops, what, ooh. Yeah. two years later, Benjamin described the Anglis Novus as a woman, the female counterpart of himself, or indeed as himself. In, let me put, take you back. This is kind of cool. I like this. All right. <coughs> Um, he imagined the angel then as himself in pursuit of a woman, a particular woman whose name we now know, Anna Maria Tud Blaupot Tenkate, whom he met in Mallorca, Spain in 1933. Benjamin is there self-described as the suspended, if voracious, angel ready to pounce on the woman he desires. Receding as time takes him forward, he hovers with persistence. Quote, in short, nothing could weaken the man's patience. <laughs> this, I mean, Benjamin had a rather interrupted life, sexual life, but he was always ready to pounce, never did quite, you know. So, he's, <laughs> so he calls it a virtue as great patience, but it could be something else. Okay, so um, that's what he's calling this painting. You see, it, it has a, a modulation in his life which has a transitoriness of meaning. It's not fixated in some sort of reified form. So this is how he understood the relationship between image and caption. The latter, the caption, was erasable, replaceable, and ephemeral, like the songs of Talmudic angels. Now, Paul Clay, too, envisioned multiple angels, and they were topical, and that's where we get to that one. That's a clay painting. Uh, this is Der Held mit uh, dem Flügel, The Hero with the Wing, from 1905. The caption, bottom right, reads, especially endowed by nature with one wing, he, that is the hero, has therefore formed the idea of being destined to fly, whereby he perishes. So in 1905, his angel was a modern Icarus whose one wing signaled the earliest mechanical flights. But Clay drew at least 50 different angels during his life, over half of them in the last year of his life, which happened to be 1940, the same year that Benjamin died. And here I'm going to show you, because these are just so wonderful, these angels that he comes up with. This is an uh, angel still female <coughs> by Clay. 1939. Here we have a Christian ghost angel. Here we have, uh, uh, let's see, angel alongside. Um, 
I don't know the titles of these. It's not written in my text, so I don't know the titles of these. Uh, maybe they're untitled. It just says Engel in the bottom. Um, but they're quite beautiful. And this one is my favorite. Angel applicant. He's applying to be an angel. He hasn't quite got it yet, but he's applying to be an angel or she. <laughs> anyway, and then uh, let's see. There's one more. I do believe Eng Engel from Stern, the angel from the star. <laughs> And then perhaps my very favorite, forgetful angel. So, politics and love, autobiography and transcendent truth, these were thought together by Benjamin. In contrast to the loss of this polyvalence in a museum context. For Benjamin, Art is just one form of human creation, no more or differently to be evaluated than any other. For example, a building type, a technological invention, a social institution, or an object of child's play. All of these forms consist of the human shaping of matter that is itself not humanly created. The material world is God's creation. Its distinguishing sign, is transitoriness. It manifests its divine origins by eternally passing away. Transitoriness is the order of human happiness, which does not master nature, but speaks its name. Humans transform the residue of God's creative word, and I'm citing or paraphrasing from Benjamin, one could say, by bringing the natural world to speech in the secular language of human happiness. These two processes, secular and divine, face in opposing directions, like two parallel arrows simultaneously in play. Despite antithetical positioning, secular happiness and divine creation are in synergy, each augmenting the other in time. Quote, just as a force, by virtue of the path it is moving along, can augment another force in the opposite path. Now, this is a famous, very difficult image that Benjamin has of an arrow facing in two directions. And it was funny, at Ramallah, people from all different places had the most crazy ideas of this arrow. Either it was an arrow that was shaped like a boomerang or you know whatever it was. But this is the way I've always seen this image of the arrows facing both way, ways. <coughs> One, the transitoriness of human happiness, um, which is human experience of the divine in nature. And it can be, sexual happiness can be any kind of happiness. I mean, you know, happiness is very rare. Uh, and it is divine. Um, it's a gift from God. And God's creation as the eternal passing of nature, the transitoriness of eternal truth. Uh, this simultaneously personal, political, and theological, mystical idea of truth is the natural kernel of Benjamin's Marxist and Messianic convictions. It remains so constant in his lifetime of writing that dating this theological, political fragment, a text that deals with this theme directly and contains the image of counterfacing arrows, is the object of irresolvable philological dispute as to whether it was written in the early 1920s or in 1937-38, that is just a few years before his death. The passing presence of the material world and of human happiness in it leaves us with the metaphysical necessity of affirming transitoriness because only in passing is truth available to us and also happiness. So the image of truth is time sensitive. It is not that truth changes, we do. So now we hit the difficulty, which is how do you move from this personal experience to uh, the collective? 
Leyenda, that which is to be read. Leyenda, that which is to be believed. That's the topic of the next section. The remembered past is preserved in stories. As part of the collective imagination, it becomes legend. And then I have something I'm saying, I'm not sure it's true, but what is too terrible in an individual's experience cannot be remembered. In legend, individually lived experience is whitewashed in the process of collectivizing it, cleansing it of that which is truly terrifying, ambiguity. When legends are appropriated by power and fixed to objects, lifting these objects out of history and preserving them with a nimbus of absoluteness, good versus evil, right versus wrong, redeem versus damned, at that point, legends become orthodoxy, setting the parameters of right belief. Such legends are formed out of irreducible, unchanging elements that refer to mythic constructs, and I consider among the mythic constructs some very modern ones. One, the nation. Two, the West. Three, the terrorist. Four, the Muslim. Five, the Jew. These constructs, reassembled in various ways, police how the past is read, thereby securing the borders of orthodoxy in a way that violates what is fundamental to history, which is transitoriness. When the past is constrained as a timeless medium, collective memory becomes a mode of argumentation. I'm sorry. Collective memory becomes a mode of entrapment. Okay, we'll think that one through. Once the sense of the world is formulated in this way, history enters the magic circle of political theology. Right belief legitimates power, that legitimates right belief. You have a closed circle. Orthodox remembrance is capable of performing murder on the material world, not only what has been in history, but what exists today. Collective memory becomes conformism. Anyone who remembers differently is suspect. Control in the present of how the past is read is therefore no small matter. Archives, museums, libraries, legal traditions, institutional records, all of these are storehouses of the past. Their benefactors supervise the production of orthodoxy. Although religious and secular ruling groups are often in competition with and among each other in determining just what that orthodoxy is. But even a book or even an image can be threatening if it escapes the particular manner of reading that is affirmed by power. Archivists and scribes, artists and academics find their patrons within this ruling milieu. Indeed, learning is the passion of the powerful. The symbiotic relationship between knowledge and power is critical for maintaining order. Rulers cannot survive it's lost for long. But orthodoxy is in constant danger of being undermined by the knowledge process itself. Storehouses of the past harbor evidence of errors, ambiguities, complexities, not to speak of outright lies, that discredit official belief and threaten to top and topple collective legends. The production of knowledge without a, pa a patron, we can think of Volker Benjamin here, has been described as apocalyptic in its historical implications. And that's actually from Jonathan C. Smith, who's a very fine anthropologist. Think about that. If you don't have a patron and you produce knowledge, uh, it tends toward the apocalyptic. <coughs> in times of struggle between the guardians of power and the guardians of truth, historical evidence becomes a prophetic weapon. While the rulers claim the role of the restrainer, the catechon, who holds apocalyptic disorder at bay, the prophets protest against the, living, the given order in the name of human happiness, of social justice, of God's will. 
History writing is the place of this struggle between the need to preserve the present order and the desire to preserve truth. But here is the irony. It goes beyond the moral claim as philosophers, <coughs> sorry, but here is the irony that goes beyond the moral claim as philosophers to search for truth. For if the preserved past is instructed with the task of bearing witness to truth, if the producers of meaning treat the artifacts of the transient material world with reverent care that is close to worship, we can think of the great libraries at this time. And this is the duty of our calling as philosophers, as lovers of truth. Then how is this painstaking effort to be reconciled with the fact that the past is never given to us whole? So we're going to then switch to ephemeral archives. That which survives in the archives does so by chance. Disappearance is the rule. Annihilation is the fate of whole cities obliterating far more of the human record than is preserved. Wars and disasters of nature are indifferent destroyers. Human intention is at work as well. Heresy, degeneracy, blasphemy, treason, disbelief. These are just some of the threats to orthodoxy that call for destruction of the historical record. Texts and images are both vulnerable to attack precisely which objects are available from the past, whose written and visual sources are saved, is astoundingly arbitrary. Only a confirmed believer can be sanguine about their providential arrangement. Great libraries disappear. Over half a million manuscripts, both secular and religious, were produced, collected, and later lost at each of these imperial centers. Library of Alexandria, founded in Egypt, disappeared by the 5th century. House of Wisdom in Baghdad, under the Abbasids, disappeared by the 13th. And these are all libraries with over half a million copies. The Library of Cordoba in uh, Iberia, until the 10th century. The House of Wisdom at Fustat, Cairo, until the 12th. Europe was late to assemble a major collection. The Vatican Library held only 1,160 volumes when it was formally established in 1475, Common Era. But intentional destruction was common. Two cases connected with religious and imperial expansion resulted in irretrievable loss. public burning of thousands of Arabic Andalusian manuscripts by the Spanish Inquisition in Granada in 1499, obliteration of Maya sacred books by the Spanish Bishop of Colonial Yucatan in 1562, along with 5,000, quote, diabolical quote, images. We don't have. Wikipedia lists 87 historical instances of book burning. But the act itself is not the issue. Historical contexts and consequences change. There is no direct continuity between past and present in these 87 instances, at least not for the point that I'm trying to make. I'm concerned with a political connection between knowledge and power that leads to the partial and arbitrary silencing of the past. And here, secular modernity has added something new. <coughs> If, at an earlier time, false belief was under attack, now the enemy takes on ethnic and racial tones. This is new. This is what the West has given us. Modern states establish libraries and archives as guardians of the imagined national community, safeguarded by the state. Patriotism appropriates the aura of religion. It purifies present acts of violence against perceived enemies whose own past is at first defiled and then destroyed. Ethnic archives are obliterated. National libraries come under fire. Recent casualties include the Irish National Archives, the Catalonian Library, the Judaica Collection, 
in the Soviet Union. Zaluski Library in Warsaw, Jaffna Public Library in Tamil-dominated North, Northern Sri Lanka, Bosnia's National and University Library in Sarajevo, and the National Museum and Library of Iraq in Central Baghdad. There are less violent forms and more common forms of erasure. It is the practice of preserving only our past that provides a continuous linear trajectory for imagining our future. Archaeologists dig quickly through layers of history to find what is of interest to the present rulers. Attention to mythic origins, the stuff of national legend, that shores up the dominance of those who rule, dismisses the recent past as refuse. Its ground is a mere construction site for future growth. In the process, material evidence of crimes against living human beings is destroyed. Their record, declared of no value, disappears, and with them, the possibility of imagining any community at all. Excavating the earth in search of the cultural heritage of a particular people while bulldozing the counter evidence poisons present consciousness by shrouding it in myth. One finds only what has already been determined to be there. And I quote from Thesis 5 of Benjamin, for it is an irretrievable image of the past which threatens to disappear in any present that does not recognize itself as intended in that image. But go deeper into the historical evidence below the legend of official, pardon me, below the level of official legend, and it becomes clear that our past is not and never has been our own. Objects survived by Trading, through trading through hands. Books move and thrive in diaspora. Scholarship flourishes through cosmopolitan exchange. Texts and artifacts follow, follow the lines of pilgrims, troops, and trade. Empires monopolize knowledge through linguistic appropriation, supporting the great translation movements that have marked the rise of their power. Ptolemy's astronomy, Galen's medicine, Plato and Aristotle's philosophy, all of these human achievements owe their survival to a series of imperial languages. This heritage of ancient Greece, lauded by Europe as its own, passed from Greek into Persian translation under the Sassanids, and then into Arabic under the Abbasids, and ultimately Latin in Toledo and Sicily, as the precondition for the European Renaissance. When vernaculars of Europe replaced Latin as the languages of power, translations became a strategy of intra-European imperial competition. The last great translation movement after Europe's post-colonial decline is into English, the language of my presentation. So we face an uncomfortable fact. Without empires, no cultural heritage. Without diasporas, no national past. The Iraqi National Museum was founded under the imperialist mandate of the British, who are now spearheading its present restoration. Sarajevo's Oriental Institute, destroyed in the Civil War, housed a Bosnian past that included ancient manuscripts in Arabic, Persian, and Hebrew, and not only on some which is Bosnian Slavic, but written in Arabic script. So our past is possible precisely because of those who are not considered part of our story. <clears throat> Today, microfilmed and digitalized replicas of manuscripts lost in wartime allow the restoration of centers of learning. Electronic co collections promise to prevent effective obliteration. 
has global communication then made imperialism's appropriation of knowledge obsolete? 80% of material on the internet is in English. Okay, so this next one is called Revolutionary Patience. In a time when Europe's imperial nations were engaged in unprecedented human destruction in the name of partial political identities, Walter Benjamin had cause for Hover, like Clay's Angelus Novus, rejecting all of existing alternatives. This hovering prophet of the apocalypse, who could find no patron in power, was not one to take the moral categories of good and evil and reverse their reference, whereby past victims of history are glorified as present conquerors. He went so far as to write in 1938, quote, wrongs that have endured are apt to foster self-righteousness. This has been true for the scholars who have emigrated. Benjamin desired a home in Europe, which gave him no refuge, not Germany, not France, not Spain. He distinguished the Zionist movement as a political organization from his own spiritual identification with certain ideas that, even if they were, and I quote, expressed by a German 10 times o over, end quote, he defined as Jewish. End quote, again, first and foremost, I must affirm what in me is valuable, and should someone say to me that this valuable aspect of myself and other Jews is not Jewish, I cannot regret that for a single moment. For him, a weak messianic power belongs to the living generation, those human beings who share this moment in time, such as all of you in this room, not to any particular ethnic or religious or national collective. Benjamin did not choose Central Park in New York where Adorno and the Institute for Social Research awaited him, or Israel to join the Zionist Gershom Scholem, or Moscow where his early love Asya Lakis was politically engaged, or an ultimate return from exile to the communist East Berlin where his friend Brecht lived out his natural life. Because of his indecision or was it revolutionary patience? Benjamin's legacy is open to us today. <laughs> the temporal matrix in which truth is embedded, essentially transient, is the criterion for critical judgment a difficult idea because it goes against conventional procedures that narrate history sequentially and at a distance. In view of the fleeting truth, pardon me, fleeting nature of truth, any attempt at permanence of historical interpretation must lead to error. This situation demands a new form of exegesis, one that rescues the legibility of the past against the conventions of official memory. If progress yields a constant heat of debris, this is due to the continuation of the same. Wars destruction, economic exploitation, and turning the other of one's own collective identity into a scapegoat as the political enemy to be exterminated. Interrupting the interminable repetition of the same necessitates remembering the past through those present inhumanities of which one is at that this very moment an accomplice. Here it is someone else's past, someone else's present that needs to come into the picture. Past events cannot provide a key to the present unless they are radically separated from a direct lineage of inheritance. When the layers of history are superimposed in a way that only one's own history can be read through them, the horrors of the past are repeated precisely in the process of paying them infinite due and never again becomes the always the same. Benjamin speaks, speaks of smashing the continuum of history. He uses militant terminology and 
quote, terrorist metaphors, that's from uh, Otto Beckmeister, in order to blast apart the dominant historical narrative. In this process, the past ricochets off the present and scatters into enemy territory. Historical fragments are the remains of an explosion. Blasted free of official memory, the fragments of history are preserved in images. They retain the nearness of original experience, and with it, ambiguity. Their meaning can be released only in a constellation with the present. They harbor a warning. The gift of the past, I might have a slide about that. The gift of the past is a Trojan horse, and I play on the word gift, which in German means poison. Uh, the gift of the past is a Trojan horse. One thinks, one knows, whence it comes and to whom it belongs, but the gift is to others, those the so-called rightful inheritors are presently in the process of destroying. There is nothing in human history that is foreign to us. But what if you cannot read what is written by the image? <coughs> Whom will you trust to tell you what it says? So that's it. Um, that's the end of the prepared part. And I think we have about a half an hour for questions. when I found them in the newspaper, they're so, they say so much to me because these kids are now 10 years older. They're like, you know, 17, 18, 19 year olds. And this is what they have experienced of history. This, um, this photographer, uh, Brazilian, American photographer uh, stepped on a landmine and, and lost the uh, upper part of one leg, but not the lower somehow, and the lower part of the other. Um, he did phenomenal photographic reporting. Okay, so um, comments and anything you want to say. <coughs> Um, yeah, okay, I, I, I kind of, I, I don't know if this is just a cop-out, but I think it's not, I kind of, um, like if you work on the French Revolution, and I'll quote Adorno saying the same thing tomorrow, uh, that revolution, already power had changed hands. It was already in the hands of the bourgeoisie. The, cl the new class already had power. Whereas when uh, there was an attempted workers' revolution, even in 1870, much less 1848, it failed. Now, what that means is not until there's another power structure in place can a revolution succeed. The revolution, the violence, does not make the new order. Now, that is kind of an interesting thought. And I actually think it's correct. I don't think that Benjamin had a choice of a good place to go. I don't think Israel was the solution. I don't think the United States was the solution. Uh, and uh, what was his third choice? Oh, Moscow. To, Moscow. Yeah. I, I don't think they were actual solutions. So uh, this is the, I mean, if, if we really take this seriously, but I don't know because you can, but you can always do this with critical theory. You end up being terribly radical and therefore not really supporting any kind of revolutionary activity. This is a, this is a danger. But on the other hand, um, the, the creation of revolutionary martyrs should not be the goal. Uh, and failed revolutions are very, very tragic events. And they don't lead to a better life for those who remain. Um, so 
that would mean that, uh, see, what I actually think, and you'll see some of that tomorrow, I actually think there is a new reality coming into being. Uh, but it's not quite there yet. And it makes all of that surface stuff going on, uh, and I'm talking about all the awful things that are happening, uh, really, in a certain way, weak. Because Brexit is not the solution, and Trump is not the solution, and Erdogan is not the solution. These are not, uh, these are not going to solve the problems of the times. Amen. So, I mean, I do think that we're in, I mean, you know, David Harvey, you're yeah. so fortunate to be able to hear him this week. I, there's no doubt in my mind that Marx has the right analysis of global capital. Even, it's more true today than when he wrote. But unfortunately, there's no international working class. Unfortunately, uh, and this is uh, Pache uh, Lukács, we can't go out and say to the people on the street, you are the subject object of history, now go to the barricades and die. That just makes no sense. That's only a philosopher's dream. Right? People are not there. They're not on that page. So the question is, I think, how does one make a kind of global solidarity? We did this identity politics to a fault. It was progressive in the 1990s, but it's not progressive today. And yet, how does one produce a kind of global radicality, which isn't simply what the global capitalist class would like from us, because we as radicals are kept out of the public eye and, and neutralized. We're not really talking to the masses. Uh, so it's, it's a difficult, difficult time. But I don't see, out of the Marxist critique, uh, a collective revolutionary subject. And I don't see a collective revolutionary subject as possible in, the, in terms of identity politics. So that leaves only one collective revolutionary subject. And that's something that shows for a moment with the Arab Spring uh, and Gezi, and then disappears again, and, but doesn't, doesn't totally disappear. But that is now a very, very difficult problem, task, and it's an intellectual task as well as a organizing task. Yes. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more at the beginning. You mentioned um, the idea of kind of uh, rescuing, or oh, I think you used the word redeeming the, the sense of the transcendent. Um, yeah, well, uh, this one, this is the toughest. <coughs> you know, but I mean, if you go back, I mean, the first century helps here. I mean, if, 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 if there is a transcendent, look, um, actually, I get this from translation. That's on Wednesday or something. I don't know. Maybe I won't mention it. Maybe I won't, so I better say it now. I think, at least the way I read the ben Benjamin's essay on translation, um, he is saying that the divine language is what makes translation possible. But no one speaks the divine language. So in other words, it's not as if, so the, the argument is this, we could not translate one language into another if there wasn't a transcendent. As, uh, transcendent, and I don't want to say what thing, person, no, something transcendent to all of those languages, which is expressible in each of them. So that's a, a, a kind of resurrection of a notion of the one, in a platonic sense, but an unnameable, unknowable one. Uh, and I, I know that's like, it's so... It's really, really, you know, unorthodox to say that as, a, you know, coming from what we are as a group of intellectuals. But I, I am convinced that there's no other way to deal with the problem of differences. I mean, there's a really nice, I like very much, I think I say it to, it's a, I don't I'll have to repeat myself, but the point is this, the, um, you know, w there's the notion that, uh, in Judeo-Christianity that you know punishment was God's splitting us up in mul into multiple languages, right? 
But if you read Surah 49, verse 13, the whole task of humanity is to cross that boundary between nations and groups. That's what, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, so it kind of like brings it uh, into um, not the punishment that we have to f forever kill each other, but actually that is the task. And I think if you're going to take it out of the transhistorical and make it a task for this generation, I would say it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it has some truth. It rings true to me. Yeah, I guess I was just particularly interested in how you were conceptual, like conceiving of that, um, that transcendent. Uh, well, I, tr I don't, because you can. Uh, but uh, it has to operate. It has to operate. And it operates in, uh, I mean, I, I do, I mean, it is convincing to me that the moments of human happiness, we've all had them, joy. Joy is maybe better than happy. Who knows what happy is? But joy, you know joy. It's transcendent. I mean, that's the right word for that experience. Um, and so let's not pretend it's not there. It's in our lives. Um, so why do we then say, oh, no, but we can't deal with it because I don't know why, because we're imminent, because imminence is somehow going to lead you to political utopia, and it doesn't, you know? I mean, I really, I, I know that this is, and I think it's good because it's, it's, uh, it goes against dogma. And therefore, I think it might be good. <laughs> Do I need a mic? Yes. Can we send it on? I apologize to the class for repeating a question that I have asked earlier this week. But it's one that I'm trying to think through with other in, in collective research spaces beyond this class. Um, it comes from a conversation that was had by David Harvey, um, uh, Wendy Brown, and um, uh, Etienne Balabar last year in the summer school, uh, using Foucault and Marx, the analysis of financialization and the effect on the subject being, returned, uh, being reduced to a speck of human capital and how the thought of how to activate some f form of subjectivity that is the other of the biopolitical or some way of being in the world that is the other of the biopolitical. And I think I got a sense that you were sort of almost suggesting something like this. And something else comes to mind. Um, it's the a very last piece by Pasolini on the disappearance of the fireflies. And then Dido Huberman has written a book on this piece by Pasolini, in which he says, you know, the, Pasolini makes this point that the fireflies disappear, they only come out at a particular time, and they've disappeared in Italy when he, at the time that he died. And Dido Huberman says that the, these constellations, these fragile bits and pieces, these blown up bits of images and fragments, can be found as, as, as supplements of excess. They are there. They're difficult to find, but they are there, and they right. can be used right. to. Right. And I just think you were seeming to be talking right. about okay, the other. That's, the that's really helpful because yeah. uh, he's named them. Yeah. I wouldn't name them. You see, this, okay. I mean, for me, it functions. Uh, 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 this this really helpful because uh, did you hear months? I mean, uh, fireflies. I was just thinking. I left Ithaca. It was full of fireflies, but they're very much like angels in the Talmud. They. They have a great time. I think they light up because they're going to have sex, and then they die the next day, or something. It's quite, you know, it's quite a thrilling uh, existence. But the, the, um, so uh, but that's how I would look at the fireflies, not as a kind of now we know the name, now we know what to name, or how to name it. Um, on the, the, the I, mean, I taught Wendy Brown's new book, the one um, on doing the demos uh, last semester. I'll tell you what I think is, a, I've always found this somewhat problematic about that, but you know, I, I don't know what I'm missing on this. I mean, if I'm so subjectivized by governmentality and biopolitics and this and that, how can I even talk about it? What gives me the distance from that total subjection to say I'm subject subjected? I mean, this is an old uh, part of the dialectical, I think probably it's in Kant, it's certainly in Hegel, you, but by saying I am subjectivized, I've already 
produce that distance, which produces an outside to that subjectificationization. So I couldn't just say, oh, I as an intellectual know that the masses of people don't know they're subjectivized, but they are, but only I know that they're, only I am one foot outside. No, either we all are or we aren't, right? So, I mean, I've never been convinced by that way of speaking, that way of making the argument for that reason. Um, you know, that, you know that sense in which one catches oneself with bad faith, the bad faith of self-enhancing for the purposes of investment or credit, you know, relationality being just competition, and how to shrug off that bad faith. Well, and again, you see, I'm, and, I mean, this may be a cop, I'm, I, I, I'm sure that, you know, but one, fortunately, you're, I don't have that much influence on you, you know. So you well, there's no danger in taking a position here. But uh, you know, um, how did you word it? You said just the shr- how to shrug off. Oh yes, because the bad I, faith. I, it's not about me being saved. Yeah. Oh, I now am pure, and I have shrugged off my bad faith. No, I'm living in bad faith. I think I'm an American citizen. I'm living, you know, <laughs> neck deep in bad faith. It's simply a fact. And I cannot uh, deny it or cleanse myself of it. Um, so the question is, what is one's accountability and responsibility? Um, and that's a different question. And as far as my, I mean, I, you know, uh, who am I? You know, I mean, that was a wonderful question and that Judith Butler uh, asked her young son when Wendy and Judith had this son in the family. and. and uh, Judah gave a lecture very soon after. Said she looks at this child and says, "Who are you?" <laughs> you know? And it's a very deep question, but it's not one that is answerable, right? So uh, this, but you see, that's the ontological posing of the question, and I steer very clear of ontology. And for me, it's the historical constellation that allows me to do that. Um, that's the methodological escape, if you will. Uh, all of this is history, right? Some of it's from Wikipedia. It's, uh, you know, it's just h- historical positivist facts, right? Uh, and so uh, there's no necessity of making an ontological argument. Even in, in Judith's case, or Wendy's case, or whatever, it would always be social ontology, never a kind of essentialist ontology. But social ontology still is this kind of, uh, you know, encasement of the subject, and then one seems to have to fight free of it as an individual, whereas, you know, I wouldn't mind. Uh, but but you, you, you made this point about without a patron, these fragments of knowing about something. Well, I think, uh, you know, I... There's apocalypse, and without power, well, but without apoc- patron... Apocalypse means what at that point? Does it mean re- revelation, uh, which is the literal meaning, which, which I think it probably does, and not the end of the world, which is something that got stuck on to that word. Um, I, would say, I would say it's revelation, which is some kind of other way into truth, which is not the one of power. Uh, and, you know, I mean, everyone in this room, or you wouldn't have been so quiet so long, uh, is an intellectual, right? That's what we chose for our profession, and I just think we have to embrace it uh, and know that we are compromised from the word go uh, and operate in that space. Um, because it's a very powerful, whatever power we have, it's there. Uh, and it's not nothing. I mean, we all love Marx so much because ideas mattered. You know, the last lingua franca was uh, Marxism. Uh, Jack. <laughs> First of all, just to say, it's great to have you here, Susan, and that was fabulous. It was inspirational. I really enjoyed it. I was, as an extension of the conversation we've just been having, uh, I was very struck when you said history is constructed, but not subjectively. Yeah. And, I'm also, and I know that's because of the transient nature of the material that you're posing against some idea of the pure subjective construction of history, which I totally agree with you. But I was also intrigued by your saying, perhaps not happiness, perhaps joy. Yeah. 
And when G. Matthew started to speak just now and said, this is a question I've asked before, I thought, I know what question's coming. It's going to be jouissance. <laughs> oh, I see. Sorry, sorry, G. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I thought, whoa, something's happening Interesting, here, right? Interesting. We're moving towards something which is an enjoyment, which is an excess, and which is unmanageable. And it's very interesting. And I wondered, um, and I'm intrigued that the alternatives for you are total subjection yeah. or transcendence. Right. Well, okay, but here's what worries me, and, and, and not so much in uh, certainly our discussion this uh, this morning uh, before the class made me think, no, this is not going on here, but I have heard it going on. Some of what Slavoj talks about sometimes, certainly bad you, I would say it's good. When I would look for history, this is all history, it's all positivist stuff, right? Uh, they would go into the unconscious as if, and then, then Badu would say, history hasn't started yet. <laughs> so I, I, I'm just saying that... The unconscious uh, is historical. Perfect. The unconscious is historical. That's right. But, uh, but the, question, the question... See, I, that's, that's where I'm beginning to see a different opening. And then I would maybe have to uh, agree with you, but we have to keep talking about this to see how, how far that goes in this, with the fact that I use the word joy. Uh, I think is very important here. Uh, excess, to me, um, uh, I have to think about that word. I've never used it, and the reason I haven't probably is Germano-Protestant. <laughs> you know, I mean, when I really come right down to it, because Jouissance certainly does not have that uh, connotation. Um, I guess I don't know how to talk about something that I think we have to acknowledge uh, and, and, not, and, and actually say it's the most sublime part of the whole deal, right? But it's not, you know, and, and I, you know, I, again, I don't, if you, you, you can't call it God, I, maybe you can't call it the unconscious, maybe just gesture in that direction, because once you name it, it seems a concept. And okay, here's something else. Anti-concepts. The reason you do constellations is to, to, is to get rid of this concept. This concept stuff, got to go. As soon as you've got something conceptualized, you're in trouble. You have dominated it. Uh, and yet we can't think without, you know, obviously we can't think without concepts. And, and Adorno comes at a certain point in negative dialectics to talking about how you name something with multiple, multiple, multiple names uh, because, not, because the object is always more than, other than uh, what the name is that tries to pin it down. So that, I think, is probably comparable. Can I come back for yes, one please. second? Yes, please. People might have just come back for one second. Okay, I'm thinking of two things here. Okay. I'm thinking of Luxembourg's theory of spontaneity. Um, in relationship to what we said earlier about revolution, as something absolutely unpredictable and unmanageable and uncontrollable, which is what unleashes revolutions, often by the way, at the wrong right. moment as her life is brought right. death, is witness to. But the other thing I'm thinking about is the fact on the Arendt in last week, and the distinction she makes between Verstein and Arendt, and how important it is for her not to be in the realm of Exactly what Concept. I'm saying. Not, yeah. not to be in the realm of condition, she wants to translate it as intellect, understanding, which mm -hmm. grasps and controls its object, versus Verstand, which is for her the urgent need to know. It's a yearning. Yeah. And yearning was, of course, like some table work. So it's as if there's something which if you cannot grasp. It's exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. This mustn't be a conception. And she says, to think you must have it. It's like children, philosophers who think they've lost it, they're like children trying to be the smoke in their hands. So I would say in the psychologic conception, in Arendt and in Luxembourg, yeah. there's something getting a bit close to what you're talking about, perhaps. Yes. So I think Thank you. It's quite fascinating. Yeah, thank you very much. Was like, um, what I'm very fascinated by is, um, or the way how I understood your talk is, um, how do we how do we write a history as philosophy? For me, it means history as a movement, as an experience of history, as something that we cannot really pin down, fix, but it's always coming up. Um, 
as a rupture, a flash that kind of actually questions everything that we thought we know about history. And um, I love how you kind of um, dialectically um, oppose this movement and experience to something that is somehow static, not static, but common, is there yes. for all of yes. us. Yes. But at the same time, yes. it can only be grasped in a constant experience of its um, disappearance. Yes. <laughs> somehow. Yes. And uh, so making this link to the idea of translation, translation, which also came up very often in this uh, talk, and I had to think of um, an understanding of contemporary art, which um, by some has um, been uh, theorized or conceptualized as a culture of translation. Mm -hmm. So art not as a representation mm -hmm. or a huh. signification huh. or huh. an intervention, but as a constant culture of translating yeah. one thing to the other and back and kind of trying to hover in the between without yes. kind of yes. settling in one solution. This is critique, yeah. this is not critique. So That's very nice. And, and also because, you know, translation, we all know after Barbara Cassin's wonderful thick, thick book, but it's quite cheap to buy it in hard copy, which I did, uh, uh, called The Untranslatables. It's now been translated, of course, by Emily After and many others into English. But, uh, you know, this idea of untranslatables being constantly translated, or, you know, uh, this woman whose wor work or, or article I gave you to read, who talks about, I'm just, if you haven't read it, you should. This, I think the like is here in England for half a year. Uh, but uh, what I, this one little thing I really like, the proper name of confu uh, she's saying, moreover, Derrida goes as far as to claim that Babel is, in fact, one of the divine names, and that, quote, the proper name of confusion will be God's mark and his seal. Again, this uh, total uh, lack of graspability or whatever. Um, uh, the legend of Babel, this is now... Um, uh, Agatha Piela Robson speaking, therefore tells an alternative story of God's revelation where confusion turns out to be his proper name, perhaps even more real than the one revealed at Sinai. To know the confusion and to work through confusion horizontally, this is the word I find so important, horizontally, without any vertical escapes. The vertical history is what I'm trying to, you know, so bring it all to a kind of uh, horizon not a horizon of meaning that's specific to a historical epic, but a horizon, right? A horizontality without any vertical escapes into an abstract universality, such as the task of the translator. And then she has this wonderful phrase, marrying the speech of strangers with one another, as well as the task of the modern thinker. Marrying the speech of strangers, uh, which is what diaspora always does. So there is a kind of, um, if I was going to talk about I think this is what I, I think I believe what I'm telling you, I'm not sure, but if I was going to talk about a collective subjectivity, I would call it a diasporic universality. Um, the diaspora is, you know, is a, a commonality that, that allows us to include refugees and, you know, and mig migrant workers and intellectuals and the ruling class. Um, but this diasporic n nature indicates a kind of, uh, the ruling class I think isn't quite as diasporic as the others who end up, I, I'm not sure, but there's something in diaspora that is uh, a, a, a condition not to be uh, uh, shunned. It's, it's the precondition for any kind of uh, intellectual work today. Knowing more than one language, being at home in more than one culture, being not at home anywhere, you know, whatever all of that diasporic uh, experience is about, um, it seems to me it's it's uh, it's critical, it's crucial, uh, and it's not to be seen as a punishment or as something that should be overcome. Ah, oh, finally now we're in our homeland. No, no, no. The really great stuff. Might be said by a German, but it's Jewish, right? Mm -hmm. I love that. I mean, this is Benjamin talking about how important Judaism is to him. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. But translation is really kind of key here. Oh, I, I would, yeah, Agatha, the reason I know this woman is she was on a panel talking about my book that was translated into Polish, Hegel and Haiti. And she kept on saying, we're doing the same thing, we're doing the same thing. I thought, Wait a minute, you're working on Morano, Morano, you know, how is this the same thing? And then I kind of saw, well, it is the same thing. And, um, 
And this, but the, what happened was, she then wrote an article, I think it's this article, where she cites some of that Hegel and Haiti piece, translating it from Polish. And I couldn't recognize <laughs> it because it had gone through this other path. So in a certain sense, and this is what I think is so actually wonderful about writing, is it escapes your control. <laughs> it totally escapes your control. Uh, so, you know, the best and the worst of the interpreters uh, didn't mean what you meant. So again, it's not about subjective intent. We, we don't know our own, you know, how we can say what an author's intent is. Well, we don't know what our intent is when we wake up in the morning and talk to our nearest and dearest. You know, that seems to me to be just crazy. So leave that word aside. And if you do that, you take a, you take a big chunk of historians' discipline away because they're always after intent. So, uh, so it, it begins to change the project. Uh, but translation is a very, very productive word. Of course, it's all over the place now, and it's a little bit cliche-ish, but with good reason. Thank you very much for your talk. I was wondering, when you were saying uh, that something's happening and that's not it, that moment, and you're citing contemporary events that are going on right now. Uh, you know, you're saying that's yeah. not it, Brexit's not it, Trump's yeah. not it, this is not it, this yeah. populist yeah. way, yeah. or uh, manipulation of democracy for the sake of, of uh, imposition of authoritarian modes of power. That's not it. Yeah. What is interesting here, what struck me, is that there is this little piece by, by Lenin that Jimmy oh. Gordon oh. loves to cite. Uh, Lenin, the author. I don't know if he ever cites that piece called The Infantile Disease of Ultra Leftism. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. Name, isn't it? That piece yes. is all about this. You will literally, I don't know if this is memory or coincidence, citing his definition of the revolutionary situation. He writes in 1922. Okay. This is four years after so called October, yeah. which really was not in October, right. and really did not feature Eisenstein's scene, as of course <laughs> yes. everybody knows by now. So this is a a very interesting moment that he writes to, to uh, uh, British communist, Sylvia Pankhurst, who is assuming the standard uh, Negri heart position, you know, multitudes versus the apparatus. Lenin says something very interesting. He's saying, I respect the sentiments, this is all very interesting, but he urges something like what you are urging, revolutionary patience. And as he does it, precisely, he goes to these two points that seem to be linked in what you're saying. He's linking them. He's saying, look, you want to know what the revolutionary situation is? This is not people were running at the Winter Palace because he knows it didn't happen. The film was made in 1927, this is 22. That memory is not yet there. He says what that is, is that you have a mobilization of the, what he calls Nizi, which is the working masses, mm -hmm. often attracting reactionary element. Mm -hmm. Well, there's your Brexit, there's your Trump. They know they don't want the government, they don't know what to do with it. And the government system, he talks about Lord George, but we can substitute our system. They know they cannot govern the way they governed but they still fake doing it. That's the revolutionary situation. Well, that was Lenin's revolutionary situation, and um, um, there were problems with it, too, uh, with that model. Uh, Lenin did not live to see the real problems. No, no, I'm, I'm not saying it's the right, right. No, no. I'm just saying there are interesting echoes. I think there here. are, and I think that's important. Uh, and I don't know, it's, that, it's a very important to think this through. You're absolutely right. It also is true that he did not think the time was right, even whatever month it was in 1918. He, he did not, 1718, he did not think it was the right, right time. And that he was urging patience at that moment, too. The question is, the, que the difference is, it seems to me, I, I, I don't know enough about, well, remember this debate with the Workers' Opposition Party and the Duma? After the revolution, Lenin was still alive. And uh, what's the name of the leader of the of the opposition? Um, Lenin was complaining because what the Duma wanted, which was a kind of democratic body, was not proper, was not right. And this guy stands up and he says, "You know, Vladimir Ilyich, you would like this ideal working class, but this is the one you have. You know, and and this is a big problem. It's a big problem." It had to be between what? It had to be like 21 or something like that, 22. Uh, I don't know. But Duma is the Russian. Uh, yes, I know, but there. Before. Yes, but there was or? also. I call it the Duma. Oh, whatever okay, there was. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, whatever was the. Uh, 
it wasn't called a Duma anymore. It was called no, a, no, no, no. I thought the word that, was just that was a. Under the czar. Yeah, no, so, I know that, but I yeah. thought the word simply meant assembly. Uh, no, 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 no. That has very specific. Okay, so what was the name of the uh, of the uh, central party committee? No, it was it was a it was a popular elected committee. It was an elected committee, uh, elected. Uh, well. Anyway, my other question has to do with this notion of revolutionary patient rather than right. the minutia of revolu you know, revolutionary right. history. Right. And also, if you could visit maybe... But what? I mean, are you saying we should be patient or we shouldn't be patient? I'm, I'm I'm I, I don't I'm know. I mean, what are you I'm trying to, to, sort of to say that that echoes within the archives. There are echoes to what you're saying within the archives, that's all. And I was wondering if they were deliberate. That, uh, on well, we run, we run... I mean, here, well. I guess what I'm saying is in the context of today, um, I mean, I don't know what's, uh, look, it's easy to get, to think the only people out on the streets are the, are the Trumpites, and, you know, the only people who are radicalized are the Brexit people, and then you can say, okay, there's something positive there, and then you want to go with the positive, but you're not quite sure, I mean, it's all very, uh, very murky. I don't see it as a clear. I don't know what would be left wing infantilism today. I don't know, you know, what would be uh, realistic revolution. I mean, I actually think that the revolution is going to be the wrong word. I mean, there we'd have to follow Walter Benjamin, whose wonderful phrase was painted on walls all through the Occupy movements, which is uh, revolutions are the reaching of humanity for the emergency break. You know this wonderful thing. Marx said revolutions were the locomotive of history. Perhaps he was wrong. Perhaps it's the reaching of humanity riding in that train for the emergency break. This notion of an anti-progress conception of revolution. See, that's what's so interesting. If we really, really, if we really accept this, and I can't see how you can get out of, I mean, just by naming it modernity, it's still Western centrism to me. Right? I don't see how you can get out of Western centrism unless you say that, you know, there is no supersession. There's no more um, humane form. There, there is absolute, you have to allow your, your concepts, your whole uh, uh, conceptual apparatus, which is based on a notion of progress. You have to let it lift away. Now, that's hard to do, and I'm not sure it's even totally progressive to do it. I mean, it's this word, progressive, right? We have no other word for it, so you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, left, right, what the heck are these words anymore? We don't really know. But we do see a kind of um, liberatory. But then, see, I think I was thinking you were going to accuse, we, like, we have Occupy Movements, we have Gazy Park, we have the Arab Spring, we have all of these things that happen, and they've all been uh, put down by su superior force. Is there something actually going on there nonetheless? What would you say? <laughs> what would Lenin say? I don't know what Lenin would say, but you know, I mean, I don't know. But uh, I, I would like to speak. I would like to give a voice to that possibility, um, and be proven wrong by history. That's this is very much uh, yeah. Costas Dusinas's point that there is a trace that is. Sorry. Just to add to what you've just said, that I think if I understood correctly, Costas's position on this um, is that there is something untimely going on in the present that can't be recognized at the time. It's a kind of trace. And at some point in the future, you can look back and it'll be easy to judge whether it was a success or not. But I, the belief I think that there it are. Is because it's nobody's idea of what the. That's why I think it's good. In other words, we couldn't have named it. We didn't name it. It's not named. Uh, no party fought it up. Uh, no intellectual wrote it into their text. The multitude. Is it the multitude? I'll tell you what I don't like about that word. Um, it's, it seems to me too passive. He wrote the book in the year 2000. Uh, none of these things existed at that time. But to use that word today seems to me too passive, because things are going on. I mean, what was so, um, having lived through at least the 70s part of the 60s movement, and having lived through the Arab Spring, the total difference was Egyptians were teaching people in Wisconsin what to do. 
Egyptians were saying there's a possibility. That never would have happened, not in a Marxist, no, no place, because remember, the whole world, West and East, both felt that there was only one path forward in history, and that was modernization. Third world had to modernize. Second world had this premature revolution, which led to all kinds of problems, and perhaps the necessity of more party dictatorial control. You know, uh, and you had the West, but everybody was going along the same path and believing in it. Some were capitalists and some were Marxists, but everybody was going there. And I just do not think that um, we can hold on to that. And if we can't, then we have to let the concepts. Uh, we can't say secularism is advanced over religion. We can't say it. Well, what we can say is that the whole binary, secular and religious, was an invention of mostly Germans, but all historians, of the 19th century. So we can begin to unpack what those terms might mean. Uh, and the way you can do that is by looking at the word nomos, which, that's going to sound like a real non sequitur, but you know, Carl Schmitt supposedly told us what nomos means. It's always land. Not the case, not the case. You go back to uh, Judaic law, and you go to uh, Sharia, nothing to do with the land. So there are, you know, but the word is nomos, right? And it's a whole way of life. It's a whole uh, structure. You have to take that seriously, understand it, because there might be something there. You know, we can't say, and everyone believe. I mean, good God, what it might. Gingrich said, we have to ask every Muslim if they believe in Sharia law, and if they do, they have to be deported. I mean, what kind of absolute insanity is that? Uh, I mean, that's what is being said, and what, as progress? Uh, in, the, in the most, quote, advanced nation in the world? I mean, that's, uh, 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 it, it's disgusting. But it, sh it shows the, the ignorance, the absolute ignorance, the infantile, primitive thinking of those people. And I guess I'm trying to say that, uh, and, and yet I've seen another thing happen, which is uh, uh, people trying to defend Islam or Christianity or whatever, saying we have to go back to. No, no, no. There's no back. There's no back or forward in history. But what is it that has such resonance today that we cannot, uh, we cannot um, avoid uh, acknowledging its power? Then, then that, uh, that changes the question. The questions have to change. So I, I guess I started working on, a his, on history, and then I said, my god, you know, I'm a, I love my little map, and you know, mm -hmm. gonna, I loved that. And then I thought, my god, I really believe in history. I mean, I should probably be deported, because I believe in history, <laughs> right? But I don't know what it is I believe in. What am I believing in there? What do I find so valuable? Then I have to be able to somehow talk about it in a way that that isn't just uh, ideology, because so much of history is ideology. You know, starting with the whole idea, well, oh, if you have a written past, you're already advanced, whereas if you're like Africa, suddenly you have no written past, then you're not advanced. Already there is the problem, right? So, I mean, it's, um, but I cannot think that we just take all the present day victims and say, give them the power, <coughs> Let them have their history, and we will rectify the situation because we have a living example of that, which is Israel. And it didn't work. It didn't work. There were high hopes for a, uh, you know, now we finally will get rid of anti-Semitism, which we haven't, and we will have uh, what the Jews deserve, but it hasn't, they haven't gotten out of the problem of nationalism and identity politics and everything else that goes along with it. So, so it seems to me we're, we're left by default with a certain necessity of looking at the past in a different way. And, and Benjamin just is extremely helpful for doing that because he's so unclear. <laughs> <laughs> or in, in, I would say ambiguous.
the wrong word, but it can't be imminent. Mm -hmm. See, as soon as you, this is Hegel's wonderful realization, as soon as you put an imminent, you have to say as opposed to. There's no, never a concept without its other, right? And so it would be transcendent. Uh, and maybe there's another opposition to imminent that doesn't, that isn't, maybe it's in between, a kind of in between this, uh, although that implies a kind of fixedness of the two that one is in between. What about an imminent transcendence? Because people do talk about that quite a bit. In the imminent transcendent, or yeah. transcendent imminence. I mean, even uh, Alan Badge, materialists talk about an imminent transcendence. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe. Uh, okay, I think it's very getting hot. Yes. Is yeah. It, is it getting hot? I think we. It, does anybody have more questions? We have seven more minutes. If you have more questions. Uh, yes, I have a question about yes. why why you about your problem with ontology. What my problem with ontology? Because because just where I'm coming from with this question is, um, if if you think of the work that's going on in the global south, right, that looks at the um, the epistemic side of knowledges and being by the global north through imperialism and empire and colonialism of the north on the south. And the work that's going on with indigeneity, for instance, as from in the okay, south, that looks at problem, ontology. There's some and good guy out there, the yeah. oppressed, the oppressed that now suddenly can redeem us. It ain't gonna happen. Mm -hmm. It's not. I mean, I'm sorry. You know, it's mm -hmm. if blacks are in power in the United States, that's not gonna resolve problems. Mm -hmm. uh, it, there's not, and that doesn't mean that the oppression isn't huge, mm -hmm. right? Or that blacks shouldn't be in power. They should be. That's not it. But if you turn the victim into the new conqueror, they'll act like a conqueror. The whole idea is to get rid of that relationship. And mm -hmm. you can't do it by simply switching who's mm -hmm. in power. So that's one. And the second thing is, of course, that I am trained on Adorno who hated Heidegger. And so anytime you say being, mm -hmm. I just, uh, uh, you know, this is my prejudice. It's so deep in me that I will never be able to escape it. Um, it's ju it just to be honest and admit it, I, uh, being what something is, the sign, yeah, that's a problem because you have named it. You have said what it is. And uh, being is simply what is. And I just don't know how, once you've done that, you can go anyplace. Whereas it doesn't seem when you're dealing with constellations that you've said anything that is. Uh, it's a, it's a um, attempt to avoid a certain kind of uh, philosophical trap. And for uh, Adorno, the whole point of das not nicht identische, the non-identical, was to avoid that trap of identifying, which is to say, what is. Uh, and so I'm, I have yet to be convinced by a modern-day ontologist or whatever that he was wrong in his um, suspicions of Heidegger for this move to being. And, uh, and I understand that I, it's easy for me not to really take a lot of it seriously to the point that I could change my mind. Um, but I haven't yet found it, found it productive. I don't know where to put history in. I don't know where to put transitoriness in. I don't know where to put uh, 
this whole problem of there isn't a good collective, it, whether it's the working class, I don't care who, there's no good collective, right? That if they're once in power, all of our problems are solved. Ain't true. So how do we work in that other space? One would be to have a kind of collectivity that is based on das nicht identische, the not identical. Um, and how that looks, I don't know, right? Because, yes, we have um, your answer for us. Yeah, I want to ask a totally naive question because I think <coughs> um, I think to revolutionary patience for me is needs to be translated or tested within a, a kind of mindset where we realize that as human beings we have ex we are exceeding the environment that, that we rely on. And so the answer, if there is an answer, the answer in itself is a word problematic, is look at look at um, other life forms and realize that they aren't uh, subnormal, subintelligent, that they are intelligent in different ways and that we need them and we need them and we're losing them. And the answer is beyond the human. It just, it, we just have to suck it all in and realize human desire is over. <laughs> That's really depressing. Well, we, our animal desires might have. Oh, they'll, like they'll that. come back. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Well, that's uh, that's an interesting thing. It reminds me, however, uh, that um, the ecological aspect is enormously important here, yeah. and uh, it is something we share also, which makes boundaries stupid. They they are no good whatsoever. Everybody who thinks they can somehow, you know, save themselves, and you know what's going to happen if, if we re if we are arranged in the same political organization that we have today. It's going to be certain huge chunks of human beings are going to be expendable. Yeah. And that's, uh, before we get to, you know, maybe even to save the animals. Uh, so I, I, it, the political situ the stakes are extremely high Absolutely. in this. I agree with you there. I wanted to say one thing that you may not expect to move from uh, this presentation to lemonade, but that's uh, the afternoon assignment that we're, I guess, meeting in this room for a showing of lemonade by Beyonce, um, which is uh, what I will end my talk on tomorrow, which begins with Adorno and ends with Beyonce. And uh, the whole... Um, the, if you haven't, it, how many of you have seen Beyonce? I've not just heard the music, but seen the video. One, that's good. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't believe that I would be so struck by it. Um, I was extremely struck by it. Um, I, I think, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm. It's not as if I know every film video that's been done so I can say this is brand new from the whole thing. But there's something going on here which I think is very politically powerful. This is, and, and Beyonce is simply the logo about it because she lists the credits and there's hundreds of people involved in the production of this. This is a collective art project. So if one looks at it that way, um, it seems to me that uh, it's extremely interesting and it's, it's quite, it's good. <laughs> You'll enjoy it, I think. When uh, are we seeing that? Seen it. Pardon? When are we seeing that? So it's going to be, I think it's in this room. People seem to have. At when? Is it? It's it's at four? After after this. Yeah, yeah it's after, after all your stuff you have just, but this is, it isn't. Okay. At the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. End of the day today. Uh, and uh, it's, um, it's where we end up tomorrow at the end of tomorrow's day. <laughs> so. Uh, thank you all very much.